Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello, Six Packers, and welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 64. I'm probably the only host in the podcasting world who hasn't said anything about the coronavirus pandemic. I really haven't had anything to say. I'm not a medical expert, so anything I could say in that regard would be mere speculation or regurgitation of what you've heard so many times already that it's making you as sick as the virus itself. I most certainly haven't wanted to join the chorus of malcontents and miscreants who are trying to stir up as much panic as they can. This stimulus plan is a different story, though. I knew that sooner or later, something like this would come out of the putrid intestines of our government. I've been waiting for this because I am an expert on this topic. So we're going to take a look at what the coronavirus stimulus means to you. By the way, this episode is for those who will benefit from the stimulus, which is hopefully very few of you. If the stimulus doesn't affect you, you'll want to listen anyway. You're likely to learn some things. Tired of false or confusing doctrine? Want to learn or teach the Catholic faith of our fathers without dilution or compromise? Then it's time for Tradivox. Tradivox is a Catholic nonprofit working with Bishop Athanasius Schneider to restore the perennial catechism of the Catholic Church. Scores of official catechisms from across the last millennium are being harnessed in an amazing new platform for teaching the faith today. Learn more and support this much needed project at www.tradivox.com. Tradivox, giving voice to tradition. The first question to be asked about the coronavirus stimulus package is whether it's even constitutional. Let's see. The Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says, The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Hmm. That would mean this trillion-dollar expenditure would have to be a power delegated specifically by the federal government to the Constitution. Let's thumb through it quickly to see if our founding fathers say it's okay to do something like the coronavirus stimulus package. It's not in Article 1. Hey, it's not in Articles 2 and 3 either. What do you know? It's not in Articles 4 through 7 either. What do you make of that? I'll tell you what to make of it. The coronavirus stimulus package isn't permitted in the Constitution. I've already heard troubled consciences across the country, especially from so-called constitutional conservatives in the Senate, like Senator Tom Cotton, tell us the framers just couldn't see something like this pandemic coming. That's a lie, and everyone supporting this package is really just an enemy of the United States and its Constitution. People might say, but Joe, a lot of us live from paycheck to paycheck need this stimulus. We're going to suffer and lose everything. Don't you have any compassion? Sure, I have compassion for people in this situation. In keeping with what Jesus told us in Matthew 25, I have compassion for people in prison, too. So much so, in fact, that I spent years working in a prison apostolate. But that doesn't mean my compassion is so misguided that I want them all released and unleashed on society. After recognizing that this stimulus is unconstitutional, the next thing you have to realize is that the federal government doesn't have any money to give you. In our entire 244-year history, the federal government has never had any money. It never will have any money. The money controlled by the federal government is taxpayer money, our money. The federal government has no right, legally or morally, to use our money for anything not specifically authorized by the Constitution. 
This stimulus is just another giant leap at a socialistic redistribution of wealth, and our founding fathers did have the foresight to see this coming. They even warned us about it. Thomas Jefferson said, The worst day in a man's life is when he sits down and begins thinking about how he can get something for nothing. That's what this stimulus is, something for nothing. But that isn't the only thing our founders said to warn us about things like this. George Washington said, Occupants of public offices love power and are prone to abuse it. Sounds like Congress to me. Our first president also said, The last official act of any government is to loot the treasury. A trillion dollar expenditure sounds like a looting of the treasury to me. John Adams said, There are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. He also said, One useless man is a shame, two is a law firm, and three is a congress. Finally, Jefferson said, The course of history shows that as a government grows, liberty decreases. The stimulus package is just another power grab by the federal government, and it does have a dire, irreversible effect on our liberty. Voices are still saying, but Joe, a lot of us need that money because this pandemic is forcing us to stay at home and not work. It's not our fault. No, it's not your fault that you're forced to stay at home, but it is your fault if you're broke. From the very first day of the Cantankerous Catholic, I've warned you over and over again that your finances are a tragedy waiting to happen. The dwindling number of actual adults in this country are rightly asking why we're having to be responsible for the irresponsibility of grown children. Did anyone twist your arm to sign up for all the credit cards you've got? Did anyone twist your arm to use those cards and pile up debt? Did anyone twist your arm to buy all the toys you've got, such as smartphones and iPads? Did anyone twist your arm to get a mortgage on the house you really couldn't afford? Did anyone twist your arm to buy more car than you really need? All of that debt is your fault. From day one, I've told you that you have to have at least six months of living expense money in reserve before you can ever even consider anything extra. Depending on how much you earn and the pointless debt you take on, that means you have to sacrifice. The sacrifices aren't big, though. They're the wimpy sacrifices of spoiled children. You know, things like actually cooking meals instead of eating out, making the kids earn the money for the things they want rather than just giving the little darlings their heart's content and driving a Toyota rather than a Lexus. But Joe, we've got to have some entertainment. we got to have a movie, eat out, and grab some fun activities from time to time. No, you don't. What do you think people did for entertainment before there were such things as televisions, radios, movies, smartphones, computer games, and all the other distractions we have today? They actually enriched their minds by reading and spent time nurturing their families. Hey, there are some novel ideas for you. If I seem angry, it's because I am. By definition of the Seventh Commandment, those of you who've been irresponsible with your finances are thieves, and it's the rest of us you're stealing from. As I said, the federal government doesn't have any money to give you. It's our money. If your bishop suddenly came in and forced you to give 30 or 40 percent of your money to the diocese, would you consider that just? No, you'd consider it theft, confiscation, and tyranny. And you'd be right. In the case of the stimulus, money belonging to the responsible is being stolen to support the irresponsible. Along with our money, we're losing more of our liberty as well as we've already seen. The greatest loss here is liberty. People can change the way they deal with their money. The irresponsible can learn to be responsible. The one thing we can't get back is our liberty. It's as John Adams said, liberty once lost is lost forever. Many of you can relate to this. The men of my family, all the way back to the American Revolution, have fought and spilled blood for the attainment and preservation of liberty. 
Although I never fought while I was in the army, my father did fight, and he fought bravely and was highly decorated for his valor. I sacrificed a son for liberty. So when irresponsible spoiled brats posing as adults come along and rob me of some of that liberty, yeah, I get angry. To be perfectly frank, I hope those of you who've lived your lives fiscally irresponsibly have suffered through this pandemic. It's not that I want to see people suffer. I don't. You see, people only change when they suffer. People who don't change simply haven't suffered enough yet. It's the same principle behind spanking a miscreant child. If you've had to suffer financially through this pandemic, then now maybe you're ready for the change I've been preaching to you repeatedly for more than a year now. How? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. The very first thing you need to do is go through your current monthly expenditures. There's a ton of stuff you don't need, things you're just wasting money on. For example, there isn't a soul on earth who needs to text anyone, so you don't need to be paying extra for texting. Your kids don't need it, and you don't need it. It wasn't that long ago that we actually spoke to one another. While we're on the subject, take away your kids' smartphones and iPads. They don't need them. One of the absolutely most dangerous things children can have is any device that allows them to take a picture and send it to someone else. They also shouldn't have internet access that you're not monitoring. Another thing you can completely remove from your monthly expenditures is dining out. Until you have a six-month reserve in savings and all your credit card debt is paid, you should absolutely never eat out. That's a waste of money. When this nation was actually populated by adults, there were entire generations of family who never even saw the inside of a restaurant. Those establishments were for the wealthy, and the average everyday citizen couldn't afford them. And until you're on solid financial footing, you can't afford them either. After identifying your wasted expenditures, open your wallet. Take out every single one of your credit cards and cut them up. The only card you need is your debit card, because if you can't afford to pay cash for a purchase, you don't need whatever it is you're wanting to buy. And before you make a purchase, honestly and objectively ask yourself if you really need what you're about to buy. Don't tell yourself something stupidly selfish like you deserve a little reward, even something as small as a candy bar. You don't deserve any reward at all until you're on a sound financial footing. You also shouldn't justify spending by telling yourself a thing is only a dollar. Those only a dollar purchases add up, big time. It doesn't take many only a dollar purchases to turn into ten or hundred dollar expenditures. I once knew a woman who prided herself in being thrifty because she did her best to make only a dollar purchases. She made very good money working for the Postal Service, yet she was always broke. That should tell you something. Now that you've found what to eliminate from your monthly expenditures and destroy your credit cards, it's time to make a budget. When you make a budget, there are three things you must do. The first thing is to pay yourself. Take 10% of your paycheck and put it into a savings account. That's how you begin to build that six-month reserve I've been talking about. The second thing you must do is include God in your budget. You not only have a moral obligation to give back to him, but you'll find that when you freely give, he'll reward you. The third thing you need to do is stick to your budget as if your life depends on it. As you now know, it does. If you're like most Americans, your clothing budget is way out of line. When I was in my mid to late 20s, I was very well off. It was nothing for me to buy a $2,500 suit. I only wore conservative business attire, which tended in those days to be more costly than highly fashionable clothing. After I became a Catholic and began to grow in the spiritual life, I realized that those things really have no meaning. They're materialistic, and materialism is an evil a Catholic must avoid. Do you want to know how much I've spent on clothing in the last 12 months? Exactly $62. My wife spent exactly zero. 
You don't need the clothing you think you do. What's wrong with letting your clothes get worn out before you replace them? Who do you need to impress? If you need to feel confident and good about yourself by buying new clothes, then you have a spiritual problem that needs to be dealt with. There's a lot more to getting your financial house in order, but this is a good start. Once you've implemented the steps I mentioned in this episode, it shouldn't be long before you begin to see a little extra money left over at the end of the month. That doesn't mean it's all right to spend it. That's just a little extra to slap into your savings account. It's time to grow up. It's time to make being an adult the norm in America again instead of the exception. If you take my advice and learn to discipline yourself, discipline your family spending, and put your financial affairs in order, you'll discover that life is a lot less stressful and your family will be happier and more productive. You don't need the federal government's socialistic financial support. Can you see yourself making converts? Very few books have ever been written to teach the mechanics of practical Catholic evangelization, something all Catholics are obliged to do. Of the books available, none teach you a step-by-step method for actually cultivating an inquirer, then taking that inquirer all the way to the baptismal font. Until now, nobody is more qualified to teach Catholic evangelization than Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy. Joe Sixpack has made hundreds of converts since 1988 in small group and one-on-one venues, and 84 of them are his adult godchildren. Consequently, Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, is a virtual treasure trove of how-to resources for evangelization. In the Lay Evangelist's Handbook, Joe Sixpack will show you how to become one of God's rock stars of evangelization, what the two primary obligations are for all Catholics that most people don't know how to begin the journey to becoming a saint, the actual mechanics of productive evangelization, the dangers of nice Catholicism, how to hear God laugh, what to do step-by-step to win over a convert, and much, much more. Get your copy of the Lay Evangelist's Handbook by Joe Sixpack, The Every Catholic Guy, today in print or ebook on Amazon, Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to Western Journal. A Planned Parenthood worker allegedly purposely coughed on participants in a pro-life vigil at a clinic in downtown Pittsburgh. This is disgusting in any circumstance. It is pure hate in the midst of a global pandemic. Sean Kerry, president of the pro-life campaign 40 Days for Life, wrote in a blog post. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News Pick number four. Hats off to LifeSite News. Catholic priests are doing their part to heroically battle against the coronavirus, finding creative means to not only deliver the sacraments to the faithful, but also to beg God for mercy and deliverance. This is an amazing piece. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News Pick pick number three. three. Hats off to Western Journal. His Twitter handle is Jester D. All he shares about himself with the Twitter sphere is that he hails from California. His Twitter biography describes himself as, quote, just a fool juggling random thoughts to entertain the masses, end quote. Then the day came when Jester D. sent a message about the coronavirus crisis that, from the thousands of retweets and hundreds of thousands of likes, Twitter users needed to read. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic News Pick number, number two. two. Hats off to PJ Media. Unlike Eric Holder's Justice Department, the Trump administration is on the forefront of defending First Amendment religious liberty. 
Justice Department Civil Rights Division lawyers will be appearing in an Indiana state court to defend the religious freedom of Catholic schools. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic news, news pick, pick number one. one. Hats off to LifeSite News. Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas, has asked all bishops, priests, and deacons to find creative ways to give our daily bread to the faithful members of the body of Christ. But clergy around the world had already begun to answer the call to find innovative ways to deliver the sacraments and otherwise keep the faith alive in their parishes and dioceses. I was incredibly impressed by this, and I think you will be too. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Warning to snowflakes. If he thinks it, he says it. It's time now for Joe Sixpack's Common Sense Catholic Commentary. Last week we began looking at the four marks of the church, that is, that she is one. This week we'll continue with the second mark, stating that the church is holy. Before we do, however, I need to define the origin of the church a little more deeply. Have you ever wondered why the Catholic Church refers to herself as the mystical body of Christ? It comes from sacred scripture. In 1 Corinthians 12.12, St. Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ. But in order to understand why he does so, as well as its significance, we need to focus on Paul's conversion. St. Paul, who prior to his conversion was called Saul, was a Pharisee and a persecutor of Christians. At the time of his conversion, Saul was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians when Jesus appeared to him in his glorified state. Scripture says, Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. This encounter with Jesus apparently formed St. Paul's theology on the church. Paul saw that the church was a divine institution, with Jesus as its head and we as its members. Indeed, Paul saw that Jesus Christ and his church are one and the same. Notice that Jesus didn't ask, why do you persecute my followers, or why do you persecute my church? He asked, why do you persecute me? Jesus had ascended into heaven a long time before St. Paul met him on the road to Damascus, so Paul couldn't have been persecuting Jesus. The persecution was of his followers, but that isn't what Jesus says. Christ's words are clearly indicative that to persecute his followers is to persecute him. This is why St. Paul taught that we're members of the body of Christ, the church, and he is its head. Paul understood that Jesus and his church are one. Since Jesus and his church are one, and since Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity, then the Catholic Church is a living, breathing, divine body. For a body to live, it must have a soul. The soul of the church is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. That's why we can say a true mark of the Catholic Church is that she is holy. The church teaches holy doctrine and gives her members means of living holy lives, thus producing saints in every age. The founders of other churches, Luther, Calvin, Swingley, Wesley, were but mere men and in no way remarkable for heroic virtue. Our founder is Jesus Christ, God himself, the author and very definition of virtue. The Catholic Church is holy because of her intimate union with Christ as his bride and his mystical body. Catholics are a chosen people because they are branches of the true vine, Jesus Christ. Although people outside her fold may, through invincible ignorance, be members of the church in desire and thus share in their divine life, their churches are cast forth as a branch and withers. Yes, a mark of the church is holiness, but does that mean we're all holy or that the leaders of the church on various levels are holy? Not necessarily. We're certainly all called to holiness, but we're humans who often fail the test. For more than a decade now, the church has been ridden with scandals. 
Perhaps the biggest one has been the priest-child abuse scandal. Many, both in and out of the church, have pointed to the scandal and claimed loudly that this is proof that the church isn't holy. That's simply not true, and nobody demonstrates this better than St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis once came into a town to preach on its streets. He quickly learned that the people weren't attending Holy Mass in the town's only parish church. When he asked them why, they dragged the parish priest out before him, along with his paramour and three illegitimate children. While they berated the unfaithful priest, St. Francis quietly got on his knees before the priest. He stayed in that position until the crowd grew silent. Then, barely above a whisper, St. Francis said, Whether he is good for his own soul, I do not know, but my soul needs him. St. Francis understood that the priest could be steeped in mortal sin, but it was only through him that the saint could receive the sacraments, as Jesus had established. A priest may condemn his own soul to hell, but you and I can't get to heaven without him, because Jesus gives us the necessary sanctifying grace through the sacraments administered by the priest. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave us all a command. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow! Notice that Jesus didn't say we must strive for perfection. He said we must become perfect, as perfect as God himself. How perfect is the Father? He's infinitely perfect. So how do we obey this command from God? We obey this command by living all the truths of the Catholic faith and by receiving the sacraments often, especially by going to confession and then to communion when we know we're free of mortal sin. Jesus, who understands us better than we understand ourselves because he created us, would never command us to do something impossible. He commanded us to be perfect, that is, holy, a saint. Yes, all of us. And he gave us the church, her sacraments, and her holy priesthood for that purpose. Resolve today to make a good examination of conscience and go to confession this week after having made up your mind to obey Christ's command to be perfect. You'll be a lot happier and sleep much better. I promise. Next week, we'll continue to look at the marks of the church. Do you have an apostolate you'd like other Catholics to learn about? Maybe you have an e-commerce business and you want to build sales while supporting a Holy Orthodox apostolate. Whatever you want to advertise, The Cantankerous Catholic is your portal to success. The Cantankerous Catholic isn't even a year into broadcasting its weekly shows and we're already listened to in 16 countries, all 50 states, and 101 major cities throughout the U.S. and Canada. Our listener demographics are the most sought after for advertisers. The Cantankerous Catholic avatar is 53% men and 47% women ages 18 to 34. The show's average growth rate through 2019 was 24% per week. And our listeners are Orthodox Catholics who reject heterodox Catholic positions and political correctness. Relative to other podcasts and online advertising, our rates are extremely cost-effective and inexpensive. You can advertise in each show's show notes, in the recorded episode itself, our weekly newsletter that announces each new episode, all of these media together, or in any combination. So contact us today by filling out the form on the Sponsor Kit page at cantankerouscatholic.com or email Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, directly at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com to learn how you can begin driving traffic to whatever you want to promote while helping to support a worthy, orthodox, and hard-hitting apostolate. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. When my sons were little boys, they were like all boys, rowdy, rambunctious, loud, and focused on having fun. Unlike most modern kids, who have moms and dads who prefer to be their kids' buddies rather than real parents, my sons had such love and respect for me that they'd do everything they could to please me. Consequently, I almost never had to spank them for bad behavior. 
and when I did, I seldom had to spank them twice for the same offense. The way I normally punished the boys was to first have a father and son chat at one end of the house, then send the little offender to the other end of the house to retrieve the paddle I'd made for them. A walk that normally took less than a minute would sometimes take them long enough for me to have a cup of coffee. My working thesis was that anticipation of a spanking was worse than the spanking itself, which meant they were so upset over the coming punishment that I hardly did more than tap their little bottoms with the paddle. Of course, you'd have thought I was killing them by the wailing that took place. However, once my number two son became so stubborn and defiant about a prohibited behavior that no amount of punishment would break him. I'd spank and spank, but to no avail. Things had reached a point that I knew if I didn't break this stubborn pattern, I'd lose him forever to his own selfishness and defiance. So I decided something drastic had to be done. The next time he committed the prohibited offense, I sent him for the paddle. He walked purposefully to the other end of the house to get the paddle. When he returned with it, he handed it to me defiantly and bent over without even being told to do so. His defiance this time actually startled me. While he was bent over, I said, Son, I can't have this behavior any longer. I'm going to have to give the hardest, most severe spanking I've ever given. Then I drew back my arm for the first swing. The force of my swing was so swift and powerful that it could be heard in the air. When the first blow landed with a loud snap, my bent-over son jerked and shuddered. Then the second blow, and he jerked again, but not as badly. On the third swat, he realized he wasn't being struck at all. As the fourth blow came, he looked around to see what was happening, and his little eyes widened in terror of what he saw. He watched the fifth swing of the paddle come down forcefully and brutally on my leg. I was hitting myself on the leg with that paddle with all the strength I had. It was so hard, in fact, that blood began seeping through the slacks I was wearing. My son reacted immediately. He stood up straight and turned around. He threw himself between my leg and the paddle, hugging me tightly and crying in sobs. He shouted, Please, Daddy, stop! Stop it, Daddy, I'm sorry! I picked up my son and held him close, waiting for his sobs to subside. Then I sat down with him on my lap. I spoke softly, saying, Son, what you did was wrong, and you deserve the most severe spanking I could give because you'd refuse to stop. Because I love you, though, I couldn't bring myself to spank you like that, so I took the punishment for you. My son never again committed that particular offense. What I did for my son is a tiny reflection of what Jesus did for all of us. He sacrificed himself on Calvary because he loves us too much to let us suffer eternity in hell. As long as we accept his sacrifice by making good confessions often and repenting of the sins we confess, we can one day live with him in heaven. However, forgiveness doesn't mean there's no punishment for the sins we commit. We still have to be punished for the sins, and that can only be done in this life or in purgatory for our venial sins or forgiven mortal sins. Believe me, paying for the sins we commit while we're still alive is much better than the punishments of purgatory. Make up your mind today, now, to begin going to confession every week, make a sincere resolution to avoid sins in their near occasions, and begin doing penances for your sins. They don't have to be big penances, but they need to be personally sacrificial. That's it for this episode, Six Packers. Be sure to come back and listen to next week's episode. If you like The Cantankerous Catholic, be sure to write a review wherever you download it so other like-minded Catholics can more easily find it. And be sure to visit my show notes to get links to other things relevant to this episode. As long as you're on the show notes, drop a comment at the bottom to let me know what you think of this episode or to suggest topics for future episodes. 
If you happen to be on cantankerouscatholic.com for the show notes, download a free copy of The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It, Volume 1, and visit the Joe's Stuff page to get copies of my other books and some really neat coffee mugs. I think you six-packers are the cream of the Catholic crop, and I really appreciate you listening. Just remember, though, comfort and conviction don't live on the same block. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.